cada rato yo despertaba y gritaba porque yo pensaba que, que estaba viviendo lo mismo. Fueron muchos años viviendo lo mismo, viendo todo lo que miré y pasando y sintiendo. Me, me despertaba mojada, sudada, llorando, como si apenas hubiera sido ayer y, y aún todavía. Es como si apenas se acaba de pasar nunca. Me dañó mucho. Bastante. Me destrozó mi vida. Que miré muchas cosas. Miré a muchas familias. Miré cómo quedaron sus posiciones muertas. Hombres, mujeres, niños. Much, muchos muertos miré y muchas víctimas. When I looked around, it was a mess. It was it was it was very bloody in there. Um, there were uh, people laying all over the place. The first group of people that I encountered uh, looked like a family. Uh, three people, a family, mom and dad, and an infant. One of the parents was face down, the other parent was face up, and the infant was right wedged in right between them. They were obviously dead. Some people online were down. The suspect was down. Um, as I turned to look at the main dining area, there were bodies all over the place. And about that time, um, a lieutenant came in and started having people um, exit the restaurant, um, which at that time, I, I, it was great because I needed to get out of there, and I did. Do you remember that job like it was yesterday? Yes. I worked in the back, uh, supplies and storage and uh, as a cook as well. Different roles and responsibilities depending on what time of the day it is. So I was just learning the job, first job I ever had, pretty much. Yeah. So you almost didn't show up for work that day? Correct. I wasn't going to go in. My friends were going to the beach that day in the summertime and they invited me to go with them. And um, I woke up and I'm like, uh, I kept fighting it. Should I go? Should I not go? And something kept telling me not to go into work. but. Uh, I didn't want to, you know, I wasn't brought up that way where you just call in sick and lie and... How long were you an employee there before this happened? Three months. Was it a very busy McDonald's? Yeah, very busy. A lot of children, because there's a lot of children in that community and they'd all come to play in our playground and not really eat, but like they occupied the playground area. This is the Averill Villas apartment complex that has since been renamed. This is exactly where the shooter lived. You saw his apartment, number nine. I'm about to show you now how close he lived to that McDonald's where he changed many, many lives. Okay, we're leaving the apartment complex now of where the shooter lived and gonna drive to the site of the tragedy. I'm gonna say it's maybe 200 feet half a block. This is how close the shooter lived to the McDonald's. As a matter of fact, the Yum Yum Donuts is still there and the post office is still here as well. And we're already here. This is how long it took him to go from his apartment complex to the McDonald's. When the killer walks in, did you see him walk in? Where were you exactly in the restaurant? Um, I did not see him walk in. I The first idea I had of anything going on is he fired the first shot. Everything happened so fast, so I really don't know exactly what happened, but I know that the one girl, she got shot and I saw the body fly and then 
I knew like everybody started screaming and yeah, running, and screaming. Who was that one girl? Um, the manager, Neva. Did you see him firing at people? Yes, I did. I saw him coming in. I saw him uh, tell everybody to get to the floor. And, uh, and then he started uh, shooting at everyone. Uh, people that tried, tried to get up and try to run out of the McDonald's, he started shooting at them. When he came out from the outside and started to shoot from the outside, from the windows where was the playground of the children, and there was one of my daughters out there playing. So he came out from the door from the side of the hand. Izquierda y entró y empezó balaseando. Entonces, cuando pasó eso, yo fui corriendo al playground a agarrar a mi hija, a Mireya Rivera, y dejé a mi otra hija de un año en la silla, en la mesa, mientras recogí a la otra. Y cuando yo regresé con mi niña, agarré a la otra niña y me puse abajo de la mesa de donde estaba sentada y las protegí. Um, kind of by the, the play area. We got under the table. I had gotten shot, but I hadn't realized I had been shot in both arms. I didn't really feel it. Just the heat, that's all I felt, the heat from the bullets. I'm on 714, we suffer a 245 just occurred at 400 West Henry Street. I've got about four calls on it. The report of a 245 shooting the victim, a small child, a little girl, being taken into the post office across from McDonald's at 440 West. The call came out originally, as I can remember, um, some type of disturbance where a little girl had been shot. I had no clue what I was about to enter into. I could only imagine maybe she got in the middle of some type of disturbance and uh, was shot. Whether it was accidentally or on purpose, I had no, no clue. Did the police go to the wrong McDonald's in the very beginning? Uh, what happened was there's two McDonald's, one on the west side, one on the east side. Originally, when the call came in, I was dispatched to the uh, McDonald's on the east side. Uh, about a block away, I was called again, and that was corrected. And that cost the department about how much time? Uh, probably a couple minutes, um, two, three, four minutes at most. And I heard the French fry machine kept going off because somebody had put French fries, and then we weren't there to take it when the timer went off. So I know that all the alarms started going off right away. I couldn't really make out a lot of the things he said, but he had a radio. At first, I thought maybe he's trying to hear himself, like if they're reporting on him or whatever, but he would play music. Like he wasn't trying to find people talking, he would play music. I just remember seeing the shooter's legs and boots when I was under the table. Ron was kind of blocking my, well, I was on the inside, he was on the outside of the booth. And um, at one point I got shot and uh, he just kept asking me not to move. I didn't really realize what was going on. At the time, I kind of did. The fact is, is that he saved my life and he took seven shots for me, you know? And had he not done that, I would probably wouldn't be here today. Me and my two friends, Omar and David, went to Yum Yum Donuts to have some donuts and then, uh, we think we wanted Sundays or something, so we walked, pushed our bikes across the parking lot to McDonald's, and um, somebody across the street called us, and I, he was probably trying to warn us, I guess. I don't know, he couldn't really hear him, so I turned partially around and got hit on my right side. My friend Omar turned all the way around and got shot in the back, and then David never turned around, he got shot in the chest. And then, um, so we all went down, and there was blood squirting out of my arm. I didn't know what happened, it, you know, it's, Last thing you think of, you've been shot, you know? So I dropped to my knees and he kept shooting at me. He kept shooting the car windows out next to me and my lungs started to collapse and I couldn't breathe. It's like I was suffocating. The 
This was not television. This was the real thing happening right in front of me, and I was capturing it all with my with my eyes and my emotions and trying to make sense of what was going on, trying to figure out how in the world was I going to cover this. Before I could even realize it, I heard the whistles of the gunshots past my head, and I hit the ground. In fact, I hit the ground so hard I thought I'd been shot because I, when I came up, I had blood on my face and on my hands, and I'd actually hit my nose on the pavement. Teníamos hambre. Le dije a mi esposo que llegara a San Isidro más rápido, para ir hasta San Diego. Llegamos y yo le dije, vamos a comer tacos, y él me dijo, no, vamos al McDonald's. Llegamos al McDonald's, él se estacionó a un lado cerca del correo. Yo me bajé, agarré mi niña, caminamos tantito así, entre el medio del, del McDonald's y del carro. Fue cuando yo empecé, sentí el disparo. Así como una bomba, sentí como algo así que de repente una bomba. En ese momento sentí sangre, me agaché y miré a mi hija, pero yo no la solté. Yo la abracé y agaché y miré a mi hija sangrando. Entonces yo empecé a gritar, mi ojo, mi ojo. Cuando miramos, sentí que nos volvieron a disparar. Mi esposo me dijo, dame la niña. Y yo se la entregué a ella se la entregué, entonces él me dijo, córrele, pero él corrió para el lado del correo y yo para el lado izquierdo y yo me miraba, traía mucha sangre en el estómago, en la, en la pierna y en el brazo y el señor nos siguió disparando, entonces yo todo el trayecto me la pasé caminando agachada. Por eso, cuando yo llegué con mi esposo, él ya no traía a la niña. Miré que no traía la niña y me desmayé. Él ya la había entregado. Yo no supe ni, ni a quién ni nada. Yo me desmayé. When I arrived, I parked on one of the driveways of the post office, right next to the McDonald's. The last information, updated information I received was that the little girl was being carried into the uh, post office. That's where my focus was. I had no idea about the McDonald's. So Who is the girl? I, I never uh, saw the girl, never met the girl. Walking to the post office is when I first noticed something was wrong. People were hiding behind cars and they were looking toward the McDonald's. And uh, I was right in the middle of the lot and I looked over I lucked out, I really lucked out, because when I looked over, the suspect was just coming out of the side door by the drive-thru, and that's the first time I saw him, and what got my attention was he had the long barrel Uzi um, held across his chest like this, and he spotted me and shot at me. I would have been justified in shooting back, uh, but I was completely outgunned. I had a 38 caliber handgun. The best I could do was to take cover. I got behind a truck. He did his best to shoot um, through the truck, around the truck, over the truck. Seven twelve general emergency. Seven twelve I'm taking the rounds. We're taking rounds here. Stand for it. Where are you now, seven twelve now? I am uh, east of the uh, McDonald's. Stand for east of the McDonald's. Shots being fired now at uh, seven twelve north. Seven ten Sam, are you on? Seven ten Sam, ten four. Let's go. Oh, Were you scared at all? Yeah, I was scared, but I wasn't scared panicky. I could feel the urgency and I could feel the danger, but my mind was working because, you know, I had a job to do. And uh, I think I even thought about, um, I even thought about feeling a little bit sad because my mom was going to find out that I was, I was killed. And um, as fast as that thought came in, it was gone, and I was thinking, what I had to do. Was there any point during the shooting that someone could have grabbed him? No, I wanted, I wanted to do that, but there's just no way. When you have someone that's armed, <laughs> the way he was, there's just no way. We're not, you know, it's not like in the movies where you're fast enough, you can jump or whatnot. It's just, there's just no way. I would take peeks and I would look up and I would see him go up to people and shoot them. And then I would duck down because again, not only was he firing at the people, but he kept shooting 
all inside the building. Again, it's all made out of stainless steel. So when he was firing, you'd, I'd look up and I'd see what he was doing, and then I'd duck down because the bullets were ricocheting. I just didn't want to get hit by a bullet. And he'd go and reload, right? He'd wait a few minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, and then he'd go back up to people and start shooting them some more. And some people that were laying there, I don't know if they were playing dead or if they were dead already, but he'd go up to people that were, weren't moving at all and shooting them some more. The shooter said that if they kept quiet, he wouldn't harm them. Sí, hubo un tiempo de que dijo que se callaran todos, que callaran a los niños, porque no quería matar niños, que por favor los callaran porque se estaba poniendo el mal y no quería matar niños. Pero los niños no dejaron de llorar y empezó a balasear y, y fue mesa por mesa y balaseó, mató a muchos niños. Pero cuando empezó a hacer eso, yo hice una oración a Dios que me cuidara y me protegiera, que me ayudara a salvar a mis niñas, y si no, que me llevara pronto con él. I'm just trying to stay alive at that point. I'm just thinking about, you know, breathing and because it was it was tough to breathe. So I remember it was like I went, I needed air and I couldn't uh, I couldn't get enough. So I had to take short, quick breaths. And um, but that's all I can think of at the time is I didn't want to die, you know. David, when he got shot, he was he was pretty much done right away. Omar, Omar was crying for his mom. I, I remember him screaming for his mom. It's something you don't forget when you see life leave the body because they go into these convulsions and like hovering across the ground. It's, it's kind of crazy, but. Omar was vomiting? Yeah, Omar was vomiting. David died right away. Omar took him a few minutes. And then he, he did his little death thralls and then he started vomiting. And then he was still, that was it. I knew it was over. I saw the, um, the elderly lady go to open the door and he shot her and then uh, I think he's, I don't know where he shot her. I was, I was laying down, like I was looking down the walkway and um, she went down and then her husband came over and was kneeling over her body and he looked up and then he shot him. When you first got to the scene, tell me what you saw. A madhouse, quite frankly. I don't think anybody got, had fully realized exactly what they had on their hands. They saw dead children and that should have told them right there, right then and there. They had a real problem. You wanted to tell yourself that you weren't seeing what you were seeing. I keep going back to what I initially saw, which is a dead child laying on his bicycle. I see him to this day. It's Omar? Yeah. And it was pretty easy to tell, even from a little distance, that he was dead. My mission was, in my mind, was to get into a tactical position to prevent uh, the suspect or the suspects from uh, escaping. I ended up in a prone position uh, behind a uh, palm tree, pretty thick palm tree. And at one point he came, still inside the restaurant, came by one of the doors, one of the side doors by the drive-through. And I could see him through the window. I had him in my sights for a couple seconds. Uh, the shot was not taken because at that point I didn't know whether um, there were more than one, whether this was a hostage type of situation. Officer Mike Rosario was first on scene. Apparently he had a shot. Should he have taken that shot? I, I can understand why he wouldn't want to take the shot. McDonald's windows are reasonably thick. Right, but a bullet's a bullet, don't you think? It would... Who knows whether it's going to deflect it and only wound him and make him even madder or miss him completely. But does he have the authority to take that shot? I would think so, yeah. So you think he should have taken that shot? He could have tried it but it might not have worked. You really had to think about what makes sense here. 
it didn't make sense to me that this guy would be alone. I shoot him and his buddies start executing people. In retrospect, would you have taken that shot? You know, I thought about that. And, uh, and I remember coming to the conclusion in my mind that uh, without the information that I had at the moment, I made the right call. I'm very comfortable with that. No guilt there, no living with it. What no could guilt. Have been, should have been. Nope. Nothing. No guilt, because I, you know, you can't. I mean, you could. You want to beat yourself up over that, and you can. Um, I think that's one of the reasons I've been able to um, move on with my life without uh, being traumatized in my mind, is because I didn't. I didn't allow myself to go there and to second guess myself. And, uh, and I'm, I'm good with that. Be careful, yes, he has moved back here. We have to get a couple rounds. Are there any victims that we can get to at this point? Negative. When I was in there, it, it, I was like wondering, where are the police? Where are the police? Like, it just kept going on and on. And I know that's not like okay that he's still shooting and it's been like ongoing, ongoing. He's killing more people and the police aren't coming in. Like, shoot him, shoot him. And they just, I, we thought they weren't there. We were like, we could hear the sirens and stuff coming, but nobody came in. Like, nobody stopped him. He just kept shooting and shooting, people screaming and. Then it got quiet and he just kept shooting and I was like, what is he shooting at now? I counted about 125 bullets before I lost count. So he fired a lot of rounds inside that place. And it was very loud. A lot of the rounds were ricocheting off the stainless steel when he was close by reloading. I could hear the clicking of the magazines, but um, other than that, uh, you know, I had ringing in my ears from, from the bullets and you know, from the muzzle fire. Ella estaba llorando a mis hijas y les decía, duérmanse para que no te duela, porque decía que eran, um, las balas decía que eran hielos, porque se había explotado la máquina de los hielos, y pensó que eran hielos. Le dijo, no, mija, duérmete y ya no te va a doler, y ya no vas a sentir nada. Y, y la agarré y las, a las dos asobé la, cabe, la cabeza. Él fue y me, y me pateó, yo me tuve que hacer muerta para que no me matara. Entonces él pensó que ya a mí también me había matado porque había mucha sangre alrededor y, y, y a mí me rozó el brazo y, y mi hija, la más grande, tuvo balazos en la pierna. Y, so, y, y por eso es que, no, no, gracias a Dios es que nos protegió. We're just trying to keep, keep calm and quiet so he so he didn't hear us uh, while we were hiding and hunching down in between a couple of aisles. And then eventually he heard us. So. Like you guys were talking? Or? No, um, just uh, the females that were with me were crying and we were trying to keep them quiet because they were very scared. And uh, I think eventually he heard us. Uh, I'd say about maybe 35 to 40 minutes later, uh, it's when he found us uh, hiding hunched down in between a couple of aisles. And uh, he just started shooting us right away. Remember Maggie pushing me, telling me, run, run. She grabbed my arm. I never looked at her. I just shook my arm down and kept running. And I got out of the way of the bullets. And she did it. She stayed there. Where did you go next? You I remember? ran in the closet. You went to the closet. I oh. ran. I ran to go out the emergency exit, but that was locked. Oh, that's, so that's a tough break. Yeah. So everyone that was in the closet with me had the same idea. We all ran for the emergency exit. We weren't trying to go in the closet. Why was that door locked? They were afraid we were going to steal food. And how many people hid in there? Um, six. Wow. Yeah. And a baby. So then he shoots you uh, five times. Yes. And I guess he thought you were dead. That's why he didn't. 
Uh, no, he, uh, he, he ended up running out of ammunition after he killed uh, my coworkers and uh, he shot me. He ran out of ammunition on me and he went to the front to reload. And when he went back to the front to reload, um, I tried to get up uh, to get out of there. And uh, I fell on my face because uh, I was shot in my leg and I couldn't walk. So I, I ended up crawling out of the, the, the main floor and downstairs into a closet. How did you do that despite I, being injured? I, I just the will to get out of there, to try to stay alive. Oh, that's amazing. I don't, know, I don't know what else to say. Good for you. If that's not guts, let's get rid of that word. I understand you were a great football player. Did that athleticism help you, do you think? I, I, I don't know. You know, when, when you're under such stress and you just want to live and survive, you're going to do whatever it takes. And I, I, I wasn't really thinking. I was just wanting to leave and get out of that, that area because I knew that he was going to come back to finish me off. I never looked back. I just, just crawled and crawled and crawled and just hoping that he didn't see me and hear me as I, you know, made my way downstairs into the closet. He came while well, we were locked in there and we didn't, we could only hear, we didn't know who it was. And he slid against the door, he said, please let me in. And then we said, it's Albert. And then they opened the door and they drug him in. And then he fell like amongst us as there was no room in there. And he, he collapsed like at first, but he was in so much pain and shot all over the place. Like, uh, it, was, uh, it was just horrible, and he couldn't make any sounds. He couldn't even cry, because that would jeopardize our safety. And... When I was down in the closet, um, I took the shoelaces off my, my shoes, and um, I used one on my right uh, leg to stop control the bleeding as a tourniquet in my left arm because it was bleeding heavily. And, uh, and then I grabbed a cloth and I bit on it. Now during this whole time, are you wondering where in the world is the police? Yes, I am. I arrived at the shopping center adjacent to the McDonald's at, I believe, about 4.40 p.m. I got up on top of the roof along with my spotter Barry Bennett at about 5.02 p.m. Once I got up onto the post office roof, I could look down upon the McDonald's. I could see uh, a few bodies lying inside the restaurant. I could see sometimes when uh, the shooter was firing out towards the street and towards the fire trucks, uh, see the ricochets of the rounds. The shooter within the McDonald's had a lot of advantages um, where he was at. He had a clear field of fire outside because of the parking lots. Other officers told me that as they tried to advance uh, over to the McDonald's to give aid to the kids that were shot outside the door, uh, they were driven back by gunfire. There was no cover for them to uh, protect themselves. The windows uh, of the McDonald's were tinted and I believe was laminated glass. Uh, there were bullet holes through the glass, but the glass did not shatter. It was impossible to see inside the McDonald's through those windows. I didn't get a chance to see him at all until just before shooting him. The only reason I could see inside was that his gunshots shattered a double door of safety glass. He was sitting on the counter where you would order food, had his legs dangling off of it. I could see him basically from the thigh down. Uh, he appeared to be reloading one of his magazines. I waited until he hopped off the counter and then he walked towards the door with the broken glass and then stopped to where the top of the door frame covered his head and neck but I had a clear view of his chest and torso. So then I shot him through the heart.
everybody was glad it was apparently over, but bear in mind that nobody yet had realized the full scene. Nobody knew how many people were dead inside that restaurant. Nobody knew there was an infant shot to death. Apparently when I got there, this shot, I believe, had already been fired that had, uh, had knocked down the suspect. I was, just saw a lot of chaos going on, people everywhere, you know, uh, trying to watch and see what was going on. All the police officers were still trying to contain the scene, set up traffic posts. And... <laughs> Not nearly the, the amount of carnage was suspected that ultimately was found. Uh, people were saying, you know, there's a couple people shot or something, a couple people outside because they were getting it from different vantage points. As the people started coming out, it became chaos because people didn't want to come to the police. They were looking for their loved ones, even if they were wounded. They were trying to get pe to people that they knew. Yeah. Information is of the utmost at that time. I mean, you don't know, have had another suspect that took off or, you know, was not you know, no longer in, could have come out with the hostages, could it be a, one of the hostages. He opened up all through the house, all around here. There was, there was bullets ricocheting all, all over the place. Uh, I didn't get a chance to see him, but it was scary. Real scary. He was just shooting at anything, and it was just so much, so much gunfire. It just, it's terrible. Were you scared? Really scared? I was scared, but at the same time, I was just, I was more scared at the people inside. One of the first persons to come out was Guadalupe and I noticed that she had some uh, blood on her dress. And at that point, I asked her if she's okay. And she said, yes. I said, are you, are you sure? She says, yes. She did not realize she had been shot at that time. She saw the blood, but she didn't think it was hers. And I didn't want to make a, have her panic. So I walked over to the ambulance and they treated her from there. But... Yo no me acuerdo de lo del video que de mi mamá me iba corriendo, no me acuerdo de eso. Me acuerdo ya después, adentro del correo, que yo me acuerdo que había paredes con cajitas, yo no sabía qué eran, eran los P.O. P. Boxes, y todo eh, embarrado de sangre, los heridos tirados ahí, gritando, y, y ahí fue cuando yo ya me asusté en verdad, porque ya vi que era sangre, ya, ya no vi que era cacho, pues, lo que yo había pensado. went off and that's why we couldn't hear when the police came into the building we didn't know and then we heard someone at the closet and they were yelling something and they threw the closet door open and they put all their guns on us and they were trying to figure out who we were because they didn't know we were in there I guess they were telling us like that they were in there and to come out if you need help or whatever we didn't hear any of that He was just kind of hunched up and I just grabbed his leg and tried to wake him up. I thought he was asleep like I was. I don't think he really registered that he was dead. I don't think I really realized that. I was in a lot of shock, so I don't think I realized that till, till later.
Yo no sabía dónde estaba mi hija, porque nos llevaron a los tres a diferentes hospitales, a mí a uno, a la niña. Yo no sabía ni si vivía, si estaba muerta, si había sobrevivido. Yo no sabía nada. Somebody ran up to my car and said a baby's been shot. And so what I did was I placed the woman who in the car with me, she didn't speak any English. She kept saying, it's, my, it's not my baby. I said, it's okay. And so she was holding the head wound and I was holding the back wound or some other wound that was on the back of the baby. And I drove with one hand and uh, administered first aid to the baby as we drove to the hospital. So how many times were you shot? I don't know the exact number. I have a few scars in my back. Where? Um, my mom and I have the same scar in the stomach. You were shot in the head? Yes. A lot of people obviously were involved in me surviving, so I'm very thankful. The nurse, the police that was holding my wound. The stranger. The stranger that took me. Cuando me entregaron a mi hija, cuando me cuando me dieron de alta, el doctor me dijo que me habían cortado un pedazo de intestino, que me habían sacado como treinta y tantas. Me dijeron que era un milagro, que ella fue una de las primeras víctimas que llegó a los al hospital, por eso se había salvado. Her left eye is the fake, is the fake eye. Yeah. McDonald's me está quitando mi vida pedazo a pedazo. El ojo, el olor tan intenso que me dan las todos los días. Se imaginan ustedes no poder dormir. Mi calidad de sueño es de cuatro horas, aún con pastillas para dormir. Fue muy, muy doloroso ver a mi hija en foto en esta situación, que yo no estaba ahí con ella. Los, al mismo, a los tres nos estaban operando en ese momento. En, al mismo, en diferentes hospitales. Pienso que si lo hubiera mirado así hubiera sido, creo que más feas mis pesadillas. por esta imagen. No le recuerdo rencor a este, a este hombre. Tal vez si se hubiera muerto mi hija, tal vez si le hubiera tenido mucho rencor. Were you given access inside the McDonald's? I saw the videotape, and I think for a long time I was the only one who did. The police department video crew, who I'd been working with earlier that day, went in and, uh, and shot the aftermath scene before any of the bodies were taken out. And uh, I saw that tape. I wish I hadn't. Viewing the body of a male Mexican, approximately 10 years old, he's wearing brown cords and a camouflage shirt. He is located on the west sidewalk of the patio area at, at the McDonald's restaurant. We are now viewing.
viewing the body of a male Mexican, approximately 10 years old, wearing brown shorts and a green t-shirt. He was lying on his stomach with a large amount of vomit uh, in front of his face. We now view the remains of a female Mexican lying on her stomach. She is wearing a pair of white pants and a white blouse. Now viewing the remains of a male Mexican wearing blue shorts and a blue shirt. He is also lying on the west walkway right outside the double doors of the restaurant area. I looked over and I saw a McDonald uniform and then I'm assuming that was Maggie where she fell and got shot a bunch of times there and that was the most, that was the most, that was the worst part of everything is seeing her. I'll never forget, I'll never forget what she looked like. I was the lieutenant and SWAT commander in San Isidro in July of 1984. If you had to do it all over again, would you do anything differently? 
You have the worst case scenario you could possibly come up in San Diego. You've got it in, right at the border in rush hour traffic. When the light's on those windows so you can't see through, when you have a madman firing 251 rounds out through there at those police officers the whole time, the windows had all been spidered by all the gunfire that he had uh, already done. You couldn't see in the building because of the sun. And you've got victims all around the perimeter of the restaurant and inside the restaurant. I don't know what you could do differently. According to the Union Tribune, your beeper wasn't working. And you got word about the shooting 30 minutes later. Is that true? It is. I was uh, the top brass on the police department was having a, a workshop in Mission Bay. Uh, I was facilitating that. Um, I didn't know, my beeper never went off. Uh, at some point, a couple of the uh, other beepers went off in the room and they told me I needed to get on the radio and respond immediately. So why wasn't the beeper working? Well, I don't know. This is 1984. We're not talking about the technology we have now. Is it fair to say because the beeper wasn't working that cost you half an hour and that could have cost uh, people from being saved? No, it's not fair to say that. The Mexican community was absolutely crippled by this. What would you like to tell the Mexican community? Well, you know, I, I, I learned more that day about disasters than I've learned in everything since. You know, no matter how well you perform, when 21 people die, there's simply no way to say, I'm sorry. According to La Prensa, uh, a big newspaper in the South Bay, there were some keys missing. Is that true? Keys? Yes. I don't know that. Dan I don't know what that Yost means. wrote an article about how some keys were missing and uh, the SWAT team couldn't get inside their vehicles quickly enough to get to the scene. Well, I, I would think Daniel, Daniel Munoz may have made that up. I don't know that. I've never heard that before. Um, they printed some articles when I was running for political office and uh, they were obviously hit articles. They weren't based on fact. They were based on emotion or just uh, what they wanted to be based on. So you think just made that up? I mean, that's, well, if he I, did, that's very irresponsible. Well, I'm, I don't really, I don't have a clue. What exactly was that social function you were at? Uh, I was told that it might have even been a mini party. There was drinking going on. Well. I, I mean, Jerry, this is all I'm hearing. I know. So it was a, it was a workshop that the chiefs put on. I was asked to help facilitate it because I was a lieutenant in field operations and also the SWAT commander. Uh, there was some type of strategic planning going on. It was, certainly wasn't a party of any type. And um, I would imagine we held those probably two or three times a year, and you do them during the work day. So there was, was there any drinking going on? Uh, not that I recall. Were you drinking? Well, as a lieutenant, you don't drink around anybody. Uh, and in fact, I never drank when I was in a position of authority on the police department. What time did you get on scene? I got on scene a little bit after 5 o'clock. So I think I got my notification at about 4.34, 4.35, jumped right on the freeway, but it was rush hour traffic. At the end of the day, you'd have to say there were some mistakes made. I don't think they were deliberately made. When you say mistakes, can you be more specific? <clears throat> well, Jerry Sanders, I think, would admit that it was probably a mistake in hindsight to have called off the green light, allowing the sniper to go ahead and take a shot. But he was far away and he didn't know what he had. And as a SWAT commander, he needed to know what he had. Some of the people interviewed in the movie talked about you rescinding that green light. Do you regret doing that? Did that lose time? Some people said, well, shouldn't Jerry have had more trust in the people that were there that day? Uh, the green light is simply a term of art. And I don't think a lot of people understood that. Uh, with a red light, it simply means you can't take a shot if the person's not presenting any danger. Wanted to make sure we had an accurate description, that we knew how many uh, suspects were inside before we told people to shoot. Uh, Foster said he knew all along he could have shot any time that he saw him, and he would have. Uh, not having the green light does not mean it can't fire. It's just that the suspect would have to be showing an immediate threat to another officer or myself or to another person. After that incident, we stopped using those code words and just went to plain language. So it wasn't until after you went in there that you found out that people had been murdered? You bet. You bet. You bet. Nobody, nobody knew, um, you know, that this guy was just by himself and, and just arbitrarily shooting people.
So no time during those 77 minutes law enforcement knew that people were being murdered. That's to my knowledge. You could see him moving around, you could see the shadowy figure in there, and he was, I actually saw him loading and reloading and firing into the people and firing outside. Did you know that a man was in there shooting babies, innocent people? No, uh, we knew that people were being shot. Uh, we knew people had been shot. There were some on the perimeter. There were also people who were alive on the perimeter crouched down, which meant the officers couldn't rush it and couldn't fire back in there. Did you see anyone else get murdered? <sighs> Did I, yeah, I, yeah, I saw several people get shot. As we arrived shortly after the incident began, the scene was one of absolute confusion. Shots were ringing out. The nightmare was unfolding. Uh, I saw one older woman carrying a, what looked like a child get shot in the back and the child sort of, the woman and the child fall and then he takes and, and started shooting into the, in what looked like a lot of people, but all I could see was, you know, the, the window and, and some, some signs and the McDonald's arches and it was really tough to see through the glass, but it was clear what was going on in there. The people who you saw get shot, were they inside the restaurant inside, or outside? Inside, inside. You couldn't see in the building because of the sun. And they couldn't see anyone in there and they also didn't know who was in there. I don't believe it was in anybody's mind, certainly not my own, that anything else had happened other than possibly a robbery gone bad and that for some reason the shooter was still inside and shooting at the cops and shooting at the firemen but not killing off everybody inside that he could. So what's the greater risk here, intervening and killing innocent people or having some madman just firing away? I simply don't know how you would do it differently, not having accurate descriptions, uh, having a, someone firing three different weapons so you think there's three suspects. You have to have a plan before you go in so you don't get more people killed. At the beginning of the incident, we'd gotten at least three different suspect descriptions of possible shooters inside. Just shooting one might anger any additional suspects inside to then shoot hostages. And then we got information that brought it down to just one suspect. And once that was done, then we were once again given a green light. He entered the facility, heavily armed, immediately started shooting everybody. The customers uh, that were inside the uh, restaurant uh, had absolutely no chance to escape. The fact of the matter is, I don't know if you know this, the majority of the people that were killed were killed within the first couple of minutes. Now, some witnesses who I've already talked to would refute that. I, I said the majority. Commander Larry Gore said most, if not all, the victims were shot in the first 10 minutes. Do you agree with that? No, that never happened. Why would they make such an irresponsible statement like that? Um, I can't speak for them. Okay. <laughs> When Albert got shot, he was hiding and it got discovered, and that wasn't until well into halfway into it. And he was with three or four other people, and they all ran, and a couple of them died, and the other ones got shot. So that wasn't the first 10 minutes. I tend to believe someone who was actually inside there, watching it, feeling it, hearing it, you said I'm, it was cons you said it was consistent throughout, right? So like yeah. uh, 40 people were shot. So over the 77 minutes, that's an average of one person getting hit every two minutes. So you think it was pretty consistent throughout? No, I think they did shoot a lot in the beginning. He did shoot a lot of people in the beginning, but I don't think that the majority is killed in the first 10 minutes. I mean, some of them were shot and not dead. Like EMTs could have came in and saved them, you know, if they would have had access to come into the building. So. They laid there and he would get, I don't know, bored or I don't know what his problem, he would reshoot people. What would you like to tell Ronald Edetta, who was shot 45 minutes apart and is angry, I believe to this day about? Well, and he should be angry to this day. Uh, I would be angry also. Uh, once again, I wanna, I wanna tell you that being a victim inside for 77 minutes is much different than trying to plan the response. Police also said that most, if not all, the victims were killed in the first 10 minutes. Uh, now, how would they know that if they couldn't see inside? 
Well, I believe that from witness statements and from things that people told us. Uh, that, uh, you know, that his initial firing, he walked around, he shot people. Uh, people had already gone down, he shot them again. I believe he shot people for a period of time in there, uh, 10, maybe 15 minutes. But uh, beyond that point, uh, he was concentrating his firing and his efforts on police officers. Maybe they bled to death because it took an hour and 17 minutes? According to uh, the coroner's office, uh, 13 of the deceased victims inside would have died almost immediately uh, when they were shot. Several others could have survived for a few minutes, uh, but probably not a long time. So again, uh, who knows? It's pure speculation at this point. Why was the murderer handcuffed when he was already dead? Uh, it was SWAT policy at the time to immediately handcuff the suspect. Uh, they felt that he was dead. Uh, they checked him. Uh, but they had many other wounded people in there that needed help. And so that was their first thought was to save uh, life and protect life. How did you ID some of the bodies? Um, when I identified, we were, it was the second day because this was a long investigation. The bodies were there for quite some time. The homicide people took Polaroids of all of the victims that were there. And we set up a auditorium and it was a short distance away from McDonald's. It's, this was probably one of the most difficult things I've ever done in my career. Um, I had Polaroid pictures of kids that had been murdered and I had to show those pictures to the audience because obviously these kids don't carry identification in their pocket as an adult would. So when I held those photographs up, and my partner did, we would see people that would immediately be affected in the crowd that would recognize that as one of their loved ones. And we would have to contact that either person, individual or groups, and they would be crying and emotional and we would get uh, crying, excuse me, and emotional ourselves, and we would have to get the information from them. I mean, that probably is the most outstanding thing in my mind of this whole situation, um, other than, the, you know, the, the sorrow and the heartbreak that took place with all the people in the community. We really didn't have a whole lot of violence there. A lot of Mexican families, a little bit of poverty, but uh, nice community. What it was known for was um, the heroin because of the proximity to the border. That's what kept us busy. Other than that, peaceful, uh, very pleasant place to work. I never had a bad experience in San Ysidro, but I know um, from crime statistics that it can be an, an edgy place. Um, Anything south of Interstate 8 fits kind of that profile in varying respects. It's the busiest border crossing in the world. Imagine the millions of stories that can be told, good, bad, and indifferent, and San Ysidro is the place, and it is within the city of San Diego. The city of San Diego found a strange way to annex it so that the San Diego police could control that part of the border area because it can be so dangerous and can be so fluid city of San Diego City Fathers made a conscious decision that we need to be on top of that. That needs to be within the incorporated jurisdiction that we can govern, police, and serve. San Ysidro is a wonderful little area, but it's been forgotten and marginalized and, and underrepresented forever. They don't think that San Ysidro gets its due, and uh, they just wanted the border area. So they annexed, the city of San Diego annexed it, but the, the community is misunderstood and underserved. Al, you were quoted as saying that the police are here to serve and protect. And you said that day we did not serve and protect. I appreciate your candor. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to elaborate on that? Sure. Do, you still be, do you still believe that today as we sit here? In some, in some retrospects, yes, I do. I think what the thing was that when I said it was, it wasn't because we didn't do our job. It was because we didn't have enough tools 
We didn't have the intelligence, what was going on. We didn't have the training up to date like they do now. Things police officers do now are totally different from what we did back then. Tell me some of the procedures that changed. I know the SWAT team changed things. Right. Tell us the overall impact and the changes that this created. I think the biggest thing over the years is it has made us aware of the active shooter situation. No longer are we just going to surround and contain that we need to get in there or police officers need to get in there and take some kind of action when there is an active shooter going on. I mean, you get paid to save life and that's what you got to do. And police officers know that they got to risk their lives sometimes. I remember being a little bit pissed off about being armed with a 38 and having this guy armed with a with an Uzi. It made me aware of uh, the weaponry that's out there um, and the dangers that police officers face and the public as well. Obviously the model has changed. Uh, now when we have active shooters or we respond and we go inside a building or we go wherever the active shooter is and until we put the threat down. That's how we do business now because we have so many mass shootings all over the world and uh, you know the parts of the United States um, and I'm proud of what it's evolved to. We expanded the training. We went to a full-time SWAT team. Uh, it was called SRT. All they did were SWAT duties. Uh, they had take-home vehicles. They were completely prepared all the time. We learned from all these incidents. Better tactics, newer tactics, uh, you know, uh, things like uh, the robots. We now have our own fleet of helicopters. Uh, have different frequencies just for SWAT, different radios, uh, much better capabilities and all of that. And I think the training probably picked up fairly dramatically after that. So why do these shootings still continue today and are there any preventive measures? Well, we still have deranged people. Somebody who had uh, mental instability, his family said he did. Uh, he told him he was going out to hunt people and nobody calls us. In the morning uh, of the following day, I get a phone call from the shooter's wife. And she asked for me by name in the newsroom, called, called the newsroom. And when I picked up the phone, I didn't know who it was. Uh, it, I just answered the phone and I said, hello. She goes, hi, this is the shooter's wife. She says, I need to tell uh, my story. And uh, sat down with her and she told me about his propensity to, uh, to, to shoot weapons in, in their basement. Told me about what was going on in his head just prior, the days prior to the shooting and how he was very calm about everything else, but he was very, very much uh, anti-immigrant. He really did not like immigrants. He hated immigrants, especially Mexican immigrants. And, uh, and the wife told you this? The wife told me this in the interview. On the morning of the San Isidro shooting, had about 180 to 200 people in for arraignment on minor traffic violations. Our check-in time at that was, was 8 a.m. Uh, he probably came in sometime between 8 and 8.30 that morning. He came up and uh, gave me a fairly substantial story. I was pretty hard-nosed about uh, reducing fines. And uh, he indicated that he was from Ohio, had only been here for a couple of months, didn't realize that it was a violation. I can't even tell you what the violation was, but it was minor. And I ended up suspending a $75 fine. He exited the courtroom, had his wife and daughter with him. Uh, he was pleasant, articulate. Uh, showed no stress, showed no anger. He was the last person out of the courtroom that morning. And certainly uh, with his plea of guilty with an explanation, he had the patience to wait all morning. And he didn't, even, even with that three and a half hour wait between signing in for his court appearance and making the explanation, he didn't appear to be the least bit upset. Uh, they left there, they went to a McDonald's restaurant, 
uh, basically right across the street from the courthouse and uh, had a meal. And then on the way back to San Ysidro, they made a snap decision to go to the zoo. They went to the zoo and they were walking around looking at the exhibits and the suspect said to his wife, uh, well, society had its chance. And she thought that was a little odd, but she took it uh, as one of his often irrational statements that he made. When they got back to the apartment, uh, she was tired. She said she's going in and lay down and take a rest. He came in uh, sometime later uh, and he said to her, I'm going hunting. Uh, I'm going hunting people. A lot of people have told me that this was an attack on Mexican people. Uh, would you agree with that? Uh, why didn't he commit the act in Claremont? Why didn't he do it at the zoo? He didn't kill his family. So he knew exactly who he was firing at. Well, I don't know. Uh, I think uh, more likely, first of all, he didn't have his weapons with him when he went to, to court, when he went to the McDonald's in, in uh, Claremont. He may have uh, gone in there, seen a lot of people in that restaurant, and maybe this uh, helped set him off, you know. In this documentary, I refuse to mention the killer's name because it, it's not worth it. Do you think if killers knew going in that their name would not be mentioned in the media, do you think we'd see less murders in our country because the killer will know going in that my name won't be mentioned? I think that might be a good thing because uh, that's, they're looking for fame and to go down in history as, as the mass murder or whatever, and I, I respect you for not putting the name in there. Did you become a policeman because of this incident? Yes. It was one of the main reasons why I became a police officer. After I survived the, the, the massacre and I was recovering, um, I had some, some, some sleeping problems where I had nightmares. And the nightmares were that um, I couldn't save the people inside the McDonald's. Uh, I couldn't save the babies, the women, the children. It, it took me a long time to little by little work through that. After I became a police officer, um, I was driving down the roadway about 2.30 2 in the morning and I came upon um, a burning vehicle. I just thought it was just a burning vehicle. I didn't think anyone was inside the vehicle. It was about two in the morning. Nobody else on the freeway. And uh, so I pulled over and uh, when I got out of the vehicle, I heard someone yelling and screaming from the vehicle. So uh, I approached the vehicle, it was completely engulfed and uh, I just went into action. I broke the window, I reached in, I grabbed him and I yanked him out of the vehicle and I was able to save his life. Even though he burned about 70% of his body, he ended up falling asleep behind the wheel after working roughly 18 hours as a painter and his vehicle rolled over a couple of times and it caught fire and he was trapped in the vehicle and I just happened to come at the right time and um, and I just felt like hey I saved someone's life I had a second chance you know, there's a reason why I'm here there's a reason why I'm a police officer and, and God gave me that opportunity where I, I, I didn't freeze and, and I was finally able to, to come through and save someone. Does it bother you that today the media we glorify the killer and we don't talk about the victims? Yes, I think they should do more stories on the victims. One way or another, their names and, and who they are should be out there. Um, more stories should be done of, of them instead of uh, the actual shooter and his issues and his problems and his family and their yeah, problems. How does that make us better as a society knowing all that, right? Right.
Fue una noche después de que me la dieron. Estábamos dormidos y ella se cayó de la cama. Dormía con nosotros y ella se cayó de la cama. Y yo eché un grito muy fuerte y empecé a gritar, la niña, la niña. Y mi esposo me dijo, cálmate, se, está bien la niña. Yo empecé a gritar, pero bien como, como cuando la miré que estaba sangrando. La niña, la niña, y empecé a llorar. Y fue un, un susto muy fuerte. Fue como que sí. Si, como que si le habían disparado a ella, sentí como que me la habían matado, como que si ya no la iba a ver. Y era una simple caída de cama. Se había caído de la cama, nada más. No me podía calmar por nada. Y él me decía, cálmate, está bien, es, es una simple caída de cama, y está bien. Y él le decía. Me lo juro que estás bien. Me lo juro que está bien. Eso fue. Yo creo que en esa noche fue cuando me di cuenta de la magnitud de lo que nos había sucedido a los tres. Esa noche de golpe me di cuenta que había sido una víctima de de esa masacre en McDonald's. My mom has an album of um, all the cards that people sent her about me, like get well. She has checks that people sent and she never cashed. But they were like small check, like $10, $5. She has, so yeah, people supported us a lot. We appreciate that. I read every card. If you had to tell the shooter one thing, what would that be? Why? What were you thinking? Mi esposo era un hombre muy joven, éramos muy jóvenes y él apenas nos estábamos estableciendo como familia. Él apenas había agarrado un trabajo estable, tenía dos meses y medio cuando eh, pasó eso. Do you think about him every day? Ya lo alcé. Sí lo recuerdo y todo, pero lo tengo en un baúl. O sea, trato de alzar mis recuerdos. Porque yo ya tengo una, otra vida con otro hombre, o sea, mi, mi esposo. Pero sí, todo eso nunca se me va a olvidar. Porque es algo que yo pasé y algo que yo viví. No me pude despedir de él allí porque tenía mis hijas heridas. Y yo quería estar con él y despedirme y decirle que, que nos llevara, que no nos dejara. Y no pude porque me tuve que ir al, con mis hijas, estaban balanceadas. Y pues siempre él sabe que siempre lo quise mucho. Mi nombre es María de Aquino y mi hermana era Paulina Aquino López. Cuando uh, ese día ella iba a ir a trabajar y entonces me dijo que no quería ir a trabajar y que porque le dolía la cabeza y yo le dije, tienes que ir porque apenas empezaste a trabajar, tienes que cumplir. Y ella, ella dijo que que no quería ir y yo le dije, ándale, tienes que hacerlo. Y entonces se fue a trabajar. Toda la familia de Estados Unidos estaba hablando a, a Tijuana a ver 
¿Dónde estaba Paulina? No la podían encontrar, no podían comunicarse a San Isidro. Entonces le decía que vieran la televisión para que vieran lo que estaba pasando. Entonces mi mamá empieza a rezar desde ese momento para esperar que no haya pasado nada. Tell us about your sister. Oh, pues ella era muy sociable y este y siempre tenía un pretexto para salir que iba a ir como estaba en el coro de la iglesia eh, siempre que le tocaba lavar los trastes decía es que tengo que una cita tengo que ir a cantar y que no sé qué y siempre hacía eso siempre tenía un era muy social y tenía que salir siempre Were you upset that it took law enforcement 77 minutes Sí. Before taking out the killer. Cuando me enteré de la historia que ha durado tanto la, la policía en llegar, si se supone que estamos en, en un país de primer mundo, ¿cómo era posible que había tardado tantos minutos en llegar para poder um, rescatar a la gente? Y no sabemos por qué había pasado tanto tiempo. Si, si aquí en Estados Unidos hay de lo mejor y, y SWAT y todo, y de todos modos mataron a mucha gente. Sorry. Que me perdone. Que yo quería que fuera cumplida y y que la quiero mucho, que ahora sí respetaría el hecho de que dijera no quiero ir a trabajar, que aprendí con eso a no, a no presionar a la gente que tiene que hacer cosas, que tiene que decidir sus cosas como lo he aprendido con mis hijos. Sorry. We all used to ride our bikes all over San Isidro at the time. It's back when uh, you could do that. So we'd get on our bikes and ride. That's mostly what we did after school. My husband came home from work, I don't know, 5, 5.30. I didn't know anything about it, you know. And he said, did you hear about San Isidro? And I turned it on and I was in total shock, of course, you know, and I was glued to the television. About an hour or so later, the principal called. She said it was Omar. All kinds of feelings, I think, I went through, my goodness, feeling guilty. I have my two kids sitting here, and they're alive, and so I did go right down the next morning to see his mom. I just felt I had to. I couldn't stay at home. Él me decía a mí, el pata. Omar, este, desde que fue, desde que nació, mi papá fue la alegría de la casa de mi padre y de mis padres. Él eh, fue un niño pues, como le digo, inquieto, alegre, eh, no sabía inglés. Él, él aprendió inglés por medio de Yasua. Nos dividía un cerco y ellos vivíamos en un lado y ellos en el Yasua. Entonces empezaban a platicar en, el Yasua en inglés, el Omar en español. Pero nos, empezaron a, 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 a entenderse y de allí nació esa amistad muy bonita entre ellos. Mi papá lo impulsaba mucho, lo quería mucho igual que mi madre, pero pues el destino fue de que ya no siguiera adelante. Pero era un niño juguetón, alegre, eh, era un compañero, una, un buen amigo, aparte de ser hermano. If you had one last moment with Omar, what would you tell him? No sé lo que sería ahorita él de grande, cuál sería si estuviera casado o estuviera estudiando. Pero lo animaría a, seguir, a ser un hombre como mi papá lo quiso, a ser un hombre eh, correctos, educados, eh, seguir lo que él nos, ellos nos enseñaron. Yo le diría que siguiera adelante y lo hubiera pues, animado, como le digo. Este, era un, una persona muy noble. A lot of people told me that the shooter hated Mexican people. What do you think of that? Siempre ha existido esa 
discriminación hacia latino, mexicano, guatemalteco. Pienso que en realidad era una persona que no, no pensaba en sí. Pero digo yo, los mexicanos, ¿qué le podían hacer? Digo, vivía en un, vivía en una, en un área donde la mayoría de las personas son mexicanos. It was our 9-11. You know, and I, I remember days after, people were, were stunned and, and, and shocked, and, and we treated each other more respectfully. Everybody held doors for each other and let people merge in, on the roads. And I think the Southwestern College, perhaps, was a little bit of a redemption for our community and, and that uh, people could maybe turn a horrific thing into something positive. I had something inside me that was telling me that something was going to happen. Many times I had premonitions of that. Many times I would wonder, what if my brother died? And I would. And I would go to his bed and sleep next to him. And he would wake up. He would say, hey, what are you doing in my bed? So honestly, I was ready for it. I'm scared of those premonitions now. I would just hold him, hold him, when he was asleep though, so he wouldn't wake up. So when it did happen, mentally I was ready. But yeah, we've spoken in, in our dreams, in my dreams, I've spoken to him. He's okay, he's with my uncles over there, my grandparents, he's saying it's good. Don't come here yet, you will eventually, but save me a spot in heaven. Every time I step onto that campus, I remember the day that I was sitting in my living room watching the events of this attack unfold. And what I have to do is push myself through those doors up into that classroom, into that forum where I can hopefully turn that sentiment into a positivity. Before the incident, I was a good kid, you know, I was happy and, and afterwards I was a different, different kid, you know. I didn't want to hang out with my friends anymore. I became very aggressive. Um, I was very unhappy and carried guilt. Not really realizing it, but I carried guilt. Ronald Herrera, also critically hurt from Orange, was taken to the trauma center for initial evaluation. Okay, I sent the blood to the operating room, all right? Bye. Yeah. I need a warm blanket. Right about from here. Oh, here a warm blanket. Hey, Ron, talk to me. Talk to me now. You're not talking anymore. Ron, put your arms down by your side. You're doing fine. I think about what he would be like today and what our relationship would be like today. Mateo was a lot like Blythe and Ron in the fact that he was just gentle and kind. He was a really good artist. Um, we just had this connection, you know, that we, we loved the same things. We loved Star Wars, we loved music. I used to just be mesmerized by the, his, his ability to draw. People would say, oh, God, God, you know, was ready to take him home. And, and I love God and I trust God, but I don't always understand God. I don't really understand what happened and why they're gone. Do you think about this every day? No, no. I wouldn't be able to live, when I used to think about it every day, it hindered my entire life what I thought, where I went, how I acted, everything. It was all around that, like my safety. Like I was so intimidated by loud noises or abrupt people or like being in crowds and just so many ways that it, it gets you. 
My name is Adriana Wright. I lost my sister at the San Ysidro Massacre, Jackie Reyes, and my nephew, Carlos. Jackie was 18 and Carlos was eight months. I think it was about a month before she had just baptized Carlos. She probably would have had like 12 kids, you know, because Jackie loved kids. Jackie was full of life and Jackie wanted more kids and that's, you know, that was the, her main intention. Carlos, we put him in his little suit of his baptism and Jackie, well, we were gonna dress her in, in her pink dress that she had, but we couldn't because she was all destroyed. She had no more neck or anything. The baby just had, you know, he looked like he was asleep, so we were wondering if he was dead or not because we would hold him from his right hand and it was cold, but his left hand was really warm because he received one bullet in his heart. I never knew Jackie had gotten so many bullets. I knew she protected my niece. All I know is that she was doing what her in instincts were to protect, like she was protecting her child too. But with so many bullets, I mean, she lost the strength. Imelda too, you know, she was holding her little sister her little sister's head exploded in her arms. But she prayed a lot for God to give her strength. If you had one last thing to tell Jackie, what would that be? Well, that I, that I know she's my angel. Um, I know she's with me. Even though I can't see her, I know she's here with me. I can feel her. I, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to explain, but I know she's with me. Because of the uh, physical location of Southern Division and, and San Ysidro compared to the rest of the city, uh, sure, there was a time delay in getting a lot of officers there. Uh, within the first 19 minutes, uh, containment. Now, the containment means we've got it surrounded, uh, you know, we, we're controlling the situation in, inside the restaurant. Uh, within 19 minutes, that was accomplished with the officers that were present. Okay. The people, by the time you guys got there and you guys shot them and you guys went in to try to save them, they all bled to death because the people that did survive, they came to us and, and they told us, you know, that they were still alive, but they bled to death. You, you can know? bleed to death in seconds or minutes or hours. It just depends on the wounds and the injuries. So the people that survived obviously were able to, to do that and still bleed. But I think that if they would have been there sooner or if they would have gone in sooner or, or killed them sooner, then yeah, people would have survived. Well, I disagree with it under the circumstances of this. Uh, the officers didn't know how many people were in there, how many people were shooting, uh, you know, because they heard three separate weapons being fired. Uh, they didn't uh, uh, know that they were dealing with one, one suspect at the time. And uh, questions always come up, well, why didn't they put gas in there? What would happen if you threw a gas grenade, tear gas grenade in with a bunch of people that were still alive in there as victims uh, probably would to be in total panic. They'd probably jump up and run around. So they would end up as, as additional victims because they would put in, be putting themselves in harm's way. I've learned that time doesn't stop because if, it, if you don't keep moving and, and you don't keep healing, then you're always going to be bitter, you're always going to be upset, you're always going to try to hide, and I'm not, you know. I have to move forward, and I have to value things now differently, and move on, move on with life. I only think about it when someone else brings it up. My youngest daughter found some information relating to it in my bookcase, and asked me about it about a month ago, and I probably hadn't thought about it for years since. Do you feel you got away with something that day? Do I feel I got away with something? So many innocent people were murdered. Uh, the Mexican community was really upset. Uh, a lot of the victims were, uh, who I've interviewed already said, where's the police? 
where are they? Ronald and Edda got shot 45 minutes apart. Do you feel like you got away with something? No. Um, I think the police department did the best job they possibly could given the circumstances. Could the police have shown more guts that day and the SWAT team? Uh, the SWAT team and the police showed great guts that day. How and why? Uh, they were under fire constantly. They just didn't indiscriminately start spraying the building, which would be the instinct of a lot of people. Uh, they withheld their fire. Five rounds were fired by police officers, um, and none of them injured anybody. See, this is such a tough case because if you ask victims, they're angry. If you ask the police, well, we did what we were told. So how does one look at this? It, it, it's just... Well, I'll tell you how you look at it. Bad shit happens, and that's it. And there's not always a rhyme or reason. You do the best you possibly can under the circumstances, and then you feel bad for survivors. What would you like to tell all the victims who were killed or wounded at this time? I would just give them the advice that give your troubles to God and he'll help you get through it. He'll never give, give you more than you can take. I know that. If you had all the victims in one room right now, what would you tell them? I'm sorry. I couldn't help them. You had one thing to say to all the victims. You had one chance, they're all in one room. What would you say to them?